I was a new mom and, you know, the stress and I was tired and all this stuff. And I had this added pressure of wanting to interview her. And it was hard. Like, I think I waited at least a week and a half until we started. But once we did, it was like everything about the visit changed. You're listening to Stories of the Vietnamese Boat People. Hi, I'm Tracy Nguyen Meng, and welcome back. Hi there, welcome to Season 6 of the show. We are now in our fifth year of producing the podcast. I am so grateful for all of our listeners and supporters. If you are new to the show, welcome. Our mission is to preserve the stories of the Vietnamese diaspora community and provide spaces where people can share their experiences. Each season, we curate a set of stories that are connected through one common theme. Beyond the podcast, we also are a nonprofit. Over the years, we have collected hundreds of stories that have been published through our community blog, Story Slam events, and VBP journey maps. You can explore these stories on our website at vietnameseboatpeople.org. I'm excited to share this season's curated stories revolving around the theme, Ba Mẹ ơi. I guess we could loosely translate Ba Mẹ ơi into Dear Dad Mom. There are many ways to say mother and father in Vietnamese. Depending on where you come from in Vietnam, you can say ba, bo, or me, ma, ma, and ơi is a word that is often a term of endearment. I chose ba, me, because that is how I address my parents. It's hard to imagine our parents having lives before us. I have often wondered how much I actually know about my parents even after hours and hours of recording sessions with them when I started the podcast, I still feel there is so much more I need to understand. This season is about individuals uncovering the lives that their parents once lived. I'm kicking off with the story of Lisa Fu about the making of Before Me. It is a five-part podcast series chronicling her mother's journey from Cambodia to America during the wars in Vietnam and Cambodia over the course of decades. We featured the first episode of Before Me on our show last year as part of bonus content episode number 46. Lisa is an Alaska-based journalist who has been trying to document her mother's story as far back as high school. But it wasn't until she was pregnant with her first child in 2016 did Lisa feel that her mom was ready to share her life experiences fully with Lisa. The first recording with her mom began on October 3rd, 2016, shortly after her first daughter, Acacia, was born. Her mom flew across the country to care for them both. And during that visit, she finally shared the real story with Lisa. With hundreds of hours of recording, Lisa produced Before Me, a limited series that took her five years from start to final product. Last month, I got to interview Lisa in front of a live Zoom audience to hear about her journey in making Before Me, how it changed her relationship with her mother, but also, how it sparked a journey of self-awareness and understanding, one that she didn't fully appreciate until she became a mother herself. I've been wanting to know and tell my family's story since as long as I can remember. Um, I've always had an interest in writing, and I just knew that at some point in my life, I would learn the story and share it throughout my life. I I never knew the full story of what my family went through. Um, I heard bits and pieces growing up. Um, When my family first came, they first came to America. It was the summer of 1980 and I was born that September. So, you know, I grew up with like seeing these 
old like newspaper articles of my family's first arrival. And like basically that being what I knew of them coming here, um, because it's not like my family talked about it, you know? Um, and it's not like I asked growing up. I just knew that there was this past and this story that was really deep and meaningful and serious. And I never, I never knew it all. And throughout my life, I would write versions of it, um, whether it was for like a college entry essay or an internship or something, I would try writing about it. And each time my mom would read like the finished product and like be like, oh, you got this wrong. You got this wrong. Um, so, you know, I knew my, my understanding was, was really, it was broken. Like it was incomplete. There were so many gaps and holes. Um, so yeah, I've been wanting to, to learn it and to tell it for as long as I can remember, um, it was just a matter of when, you know, at some point in my adult life, I fell in love with, with audio storytelling and I became a public media, public radio reporter. And at some point it was like, the story will be in audio form. Um, also, you knew like, that earlier. 2007 is when I became a public radio reporter. Mm -hmm. What I love about audio storytelling is the intimacy of someone's voice. Um, and I love my mom's voice. Um, and I think, though, that that, that was what uh, initially intimidated her about the process. She was nervous about her accent. And, you know, she might have just been making excuses. But each time I asked to interview her um, recorded, she would say no until she finally did say yes. And that was to do with, she was in a car accident. I got really scared. She was fine, but I kind of pushed the issue a little bit. And I said, please, can I interview you? And she accepted. Um, but logistically, it just didn't happen until I had my first kid and she was going to come visit for three weeks. And you thought this um, could be the perfect opportunity? Yes. Like logistically, it just made sense. During other visits home, I would bring my recorder and just leave it in the luggage, you know, like yeah. put it home with intentions, but just never came out. And so like logistically, it made sense for me. It didn't occur to me until later that emotionally it took me becoming a parent for my mom to open up. Your parents are both ethnically Chinese and they had immigrated to Cambodia. So you had mentioned that growing up, you actually thought you were either Vietnamese at one point, thought you were Cambodian, and you didn't really even realize it until you were in your 20s that you were ethnically Chinese. Yes, yes. It's, a, that's, it's an interesting point that a lot of people pick up. My mom and dad are both ethnically Chinese, and I believe it was perhaps their grandparents that immigrated from China to Cambodia. And I wish I knew the details of that, but I don't, you know, but growing up, there was just a mixture of cultures. Um, you know, they spoke to each other, a dialect of Chinese in the house. It was when I say each other, so it was my mom and my three cousins. So I grew up with my two sisters, my three cousins and my mom, and they were all, they all came, um, to the States as refugees. I was the first one born in the States. And my mom spoke with my cousins in this language and I heard it my whole life, but they never spoke it to me. And, you know, we ate a lot of Vietnamese food. So I also heard like Vietnamese in the house. Um, you know, there was like, there was just, it was such a mixture of all these uh, cultures and foods and languages, none of which I understood. Um, and I got so used to being okay with not understanding um, because it was just so common for me. And, you know, I knew they were from Cambodia. So what I was, I never really knew. And it was just so silly that I never even asked the question. I was like so content in not understanding the languages, not really knowing my identity. So, so I went on my first backpacking trip the summer after my sophomore year of college. And I visited Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand. And I went as a tourist 
You know, I knew that my family had this history there, but I didn't know it. And it's interesting to think back why I went or what drew me, but, you know, I was there as just like a tourist and as a backpacker. And when I came home, I I told my mom, you know, she, she picked me up from the airport and my sister and I was in the back seat. And I said something like, oh, I felt so connected to our culture in Vietnam. <laughs> and my mom was like, what? Like you are a hundred percent Chinese. <laughs> you are a hundred percent Chinese blood. And that was the first time I had ever heard that. And it was shocking to me because it, it, it finally put an end to like my guesses of what my, these other parts of me were. And I was like, okay, you know, and yeah, I was like 20 at that point. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So tell me about growing up because when your mom first came to America, she already had three children. She had uh, given birth to three children and one of them, which you'll hear about, it's not a spoiler. Uh, one, her first um, kid, her first daughter, dies um, mm-hmm. during the war, during the genocide. So she came to America with with two daughters, pregnant with me, and then our three cousins. She came here though as a single mom, though. So yeah. you ha- you have an older sister, and then you were like an, a baby, pretty much. Yes, yes. I have two um, older sisters, and I was born when. Yeah. Shortly after. So where did you guys arrive again? So they arrived in San Francisco and they were sponsored to America by the Chappaqua Friends Meeting House. So the Quakers in Chappaqua, New York. So they had to go through. So they went from the refugee camp in Thailand. They flew from Bangkok to San Francisco. And then some days later flew to JFK airport um, and their host, their initial host family was in Mount Kisco. And uh, so that's in Westchester County. And they eventually settled down in Chappaqua, New York. Yeah. And I would imagine that there isn't a large Asian community in that area. I mean, I, I think it's like 12% Asian. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> but I think growing up that that was the ratio. Um, but like growing up, I was very resistant to to owning my Asian identity because Chapka is a very uh, white culture, very affluent. So in many ways, I pushed back against being different, being Asian. And that's probably why I didn't I question didn't your identity. Yeah. 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 I, and I think that's, you know, for us, our generation, I feel like that's also a common experience because we didn't really see ourselves represented that, you know, the way that we see it now. Um, and it's our generation that's actually creating that representation. But what was your relationship like with your mom growing up? And it was great. I mean, you know, she was a great mom. So what was amazing is she was a single mom. She worked a lot. I remember her bringing me to the beauty salon. She um, got trained as a manicurist and I went there a lot. Um, I remember kind of just, you know, playing with the stuff in there. And, um, and, but my mom, we had also lived with my three cousins. And so they raised me as well. So we had a big family. Um, you know, we ate a home cooked meal every night, which I did not appreciate (laughs) at all. (laughs) Cause as a mom now, as a parent now and putting dinner in the table, it's like, it's hard. I know. Oh, like, you know, at least two dishes on the table, right. Every night, at least. Yeah. And yeah, I, I mean, I loved my upbringing. I loved my childhood. Um, I would say growing up, we had a great, great relationship, you know, going into the teen years was tough, obviously, (laughs) you know, like with everyone. Um, But what's interesting is I feel, I feel regret for the ways I I treated my mom and didn't appreciate her. And she, um, she says that I was a great kid. (laughs) So I don't know if she kind of forgot those bad moments. Um, we we always spoke English to each other. I mean, that was, she always spoke to me in English. Um, so we never had trouble communicating. I had pulled from episode one, a short audio clip. I wanted to share it with the audience, the part about um, thinking about ourselves as a brand new parent and having our Asian mom come visit. Cause I've been there with you. 
<laughs> and how that must um, feel and all the, the emotions that are going through you at the time. She's a new level. <laughs> Your first grandkid. First grandkid. It was amazing to see my mom act this way, but it was also mixed with a lot of stress for me. My mom is a small woman who might be easily overlooked, but she loves starting up conversations with strangers. She can be brutally honest with restaurant wait staff when they ask her how the food is, and she knows how to make an impression. This is what I wrote in my journal after our first full day together. Day one with mom makes me feel like it's going to be a long three weeks, but I also have to remind myself to be appreciative and enjoy the time and try not to argue with her. But we had epic fights. Fights where we both shouted and screamed and made each other cry. The kind of fights where you just keep pushing and pushing, wanting to hurt the other. At one point, I even told her maybe she should leave a week early because I knew that would crush her. This sounds crazy now, but I resented her helping me, telling me to nap when Acacia was sleeping, scolding me for lifting something heavy, offering to fold laundry. In my everyday life, I do fine without my mom's help. So I thought, why should this time be any different? I wasn't able to accept her assistance happily. Of course, she was a mother too. And in the middle of all of this, she told me what happened after she gave birth to her first baby in her home country of Cambodia. I kind of moved to my mom just for a few months so she can take care of me. Because the Chinese tradition that within 100 days, you're not allowed to, to live, to do anything, to cook. You know, for women, it's a only luxurious time, only vacation time that when you have the baby. Usually they give you 100 days. <laughs> so tell us about your mom's first daughter, Ali. She's talking about her first. And your mom got married pretty young at 17. Um, so I, I think shortly after she had her first child, correct? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, my mom and my dad married and, you know, it was the marriage happened through family connection. Um, and my mom moved into um, his house with his family and they did, they had, a, they had their first kids soon after. And, you know, so growing up, I had heard about this other sister, you know, I knew that my mom had had another kid who had died but um, I never knew how she died. Um, I didn't know anything about her. And so, you know, when you don't know stuff, you kind of just assume stuff, you know? I, you know, I remember when I was younger, a kid, I wrote a story about meeting her on a magic carpet ride. You know, I must have imagined what she, she would have been like. And so my assumption was that she had just gotten sick and died. And, you know, and it, I don't even know if, if when we first started talking, if I knew I was going to ask her about that, or if that was on top of my list, I think it just started that way. Cause my mom started talking about, um, her experience when she first had her kid. And so it was the most I had heard about her, you know, she, she told me about how she died, and it's, it's really, I mean, it's, it's sad, it's tragic. And I'm, I'm not sure when my mom has told that story before, you know, after she told it to me, you know, she, during different parts of her telling me the story, she, she cried at different parts. And at the end, she was like, it's taking me so long to get all of that out. And so I don't know when or if she's ever told that full story before. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to give away too much. It was so amazing that she trusted me to tell me and to share that with me. And I wouldn't be able to understand that before I had a kid, you know? I guess, you know, being a journalist by trade and a reporter by trade, and, you know, part of you is doing an interview, but then the other part of you is like, this is a very personal story. But did it like hold you back in any way? Yeah, I think 
being a reporter and a journalist had its pros and cons through this process. I mean, I had been a public radio reporter, so I knew how to get good audio. Um, but I did not use those skills during this because I I couldn't subject my mom to like putting a mic in her face, you know, and I thought that that would be a barrier for us. It was interesting because I was afraid to be a reporter, like the full, my full reporter self with her, but it was also the presence of the recorder that like opened everything up for us. And it was a totally different space, this this intimacy of having the recorder, though it wasn't close enough to her, just having it there um, did give us like the liberty for me to ask questions that I normally would not. Um, and for her to talk in this way and share this way, it, it, it served both purposes, right? Like I wasn't a reporter enough, but by having that and by by interviewing her formally, you know, by having the recorder going, it just like brought us to a different place. And, you know, through that three week visit, I was a new mom and, you know, the stress and I was tired and all this stuff. And I had this added pressure of wanting to interview her. And it was hard. Like, I think I waited at least a week and a half until we started. But once we did, it was like everything about the visit changed. You know, while it was great to be a new mom, I mean, I would say that those times when we were just talking to each other were the best moments of that visit. Did you come prepared with questions like your reporter self, or did you just let it organically flow? I, I, you know, I don't even remember having questions because, you know, I think I would, it was like, okay, the baby's sleeping, let's talk, you know, and I don't remember pulling out a notepad or anything. Like, I think it was very organic. It was just like, I, I allowed her to kind of lead it again, you know, and I realized much later that in, in her trusting me with her stories and my cousin too, who's in an episode, um, it's like such a different form of love that I hadn't, I didn't know, mm-hmm. you know, just that, that they trusted me with their stories. I, I know when I went through interviewing my parents, um, especially my dad, cause he was similar to your mom. He just never talked about the past. My mom was a lot more open, but I almost felt like it helped me understand so many other aspects of my dad. It has to be the right moment. Like, I don't know if I know you had talked about wanting to do this with your mom, like since, you know, 2007, but had you done it then, would the experience have been the same is, you know, as when you did it, when you had your first child, I think it would have been a very different experience. Yes, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Because yeah, like for my mom, it, she, like, that was the key you know, before she even came to visit, um, I turned 36 a few weeks before I I gave birth and she wrote me a birthday card. It's an episode is the birthday card. It was, she started telling me her story in that birthday card. And, and when I asked her, why did you write this? And she's like, because I knew you were about to become a mom and that you're ready to hear this. Um, and as far as like, you know, hearing this past, I mean, the more we learn about our parents, you know, they're, they're such complex people, right? Like we all are, but like you hear about this stuff and then like you internalize it at different moments too, right? It wasn't like right after she told me I had this like greater understanding of her. I mean, I, I knew the stories, but it's still like, it's taking me years to like process what she told me and what that means to her. Um, just this past December, uh, I went to Florida with my family and we we met up with my mom and my sister and that side of my side of the family. And we met with my husband's side of the family. And it was the first time the two sides have met. And for my mom, it was so important. And for the obvious reasons, you know, but like, I realized that when she came to America, I mean, she started our family here. Yeah. And for each one of us that gets married off, you know, it's like who gets married or finds a partner, like our family is growing. And um, I mean, for her, that must be so beautiful and magical. 
And so for her to meet my husband's side of the family, I think that was just like monumentally important to her. During the last few years of the Civil War in Vietnam, there was also a civil war happening next door in Cambodia. The Khmer Rouge is the Communist Party in Cambodia, and there was a civil war happening um, in the country. When the Khmer Rouge took over Cambodia, they ruled it with such brutality. And I think in one of your episodes, you had... um, you had given an estimate, something around, I think, like 1.7 to 3 million people had died during that time period um, because of the brutality. So how much of that history did you have to really dig into during the process of making Before Me? So what's interesting is like, I'm not, I wouldn't say my strength is in history at all, you know, and when people have given me re- reaction and have listened to it, they say that. I explain that piece of history well and a piece of history that a lot of people don't know about. And I'm like, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) What I wanted to do was to explain like that, like the backdrop of my family story was this like huge thing going on and that Mm -hmm. it, it was like their story and how they survived. And it's interesting because, um, my cousin's, and my mom, you know, they were ultimately reunited, um, but they experienced like the late seventies very differently because my cousin and her siblings remained in Cambodia, whereas my mom and my dad they ran and kept running to the border of Vietnam into Vietnam. So, I mean, to understand like what forces were 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 driving that, were dictating that was was important, like, right, like, I had to understand that. And so so I did, like, I tried to do reading, I interviewed um, some academics, some historians, to try to get a better idea of it. Um, And it was great. Those were where kind of my reporter skills came in. (laughs) Uh, You know, I grew up like I had watched the killing fields, like the movie, you know, so I had like, when I went to on that backpacking trip, you know, I toured and I did not know that my cousin and her siblings experienced, you know, being forced to leave their home and walk to the countryside of being in the forced labor camp. I I did not know that at all. And and so just knowing what was going on at the time and, and understanding that and it was, I had to learn the history, but, um, you know, there's always deeper I could have gone. You know, even what made my mom leave was they were sitting at home and they were talking about how the war was getting more and more dangerous. And then a rocket explodes, a, you know, she always called it a bomb. It exploded mm-hmm. and shrapnel went everywhere and ended up killing her brother-in-law. So it would have been my uncle that's kind of what sets things off for my mom and and my dad for running. And, you know, what she's told me and talking to like a historian and explaining all that, you know, and it's like, that makes sense because during this time, the Khmer Rouge were setting off lots of rockets and they wouldn't kill a lot of people. They would kill small amounts of people, but they just caused a lot of terror and chaos. And so it was just, it was so helpful to hear. It wasn't like validation, but like all these things that my mom told me about, it was like, that makes sense because this is what was going on at the time. And it's so surreal actually to listen to somebody who was there experiencing it, then watching the killing fields as an example, right? When you're talking to a loved one who can share with you what that experience is like personally and the the pain and hurt you know, in the survival mode that they had to just jump into, like, yes. And, and, you know, I, I don't know if I can thank my family members enough for going back to those emotional, that pain and that trauma and for the sake, because I asked them to, you know, at some point I had asked my mom, as she's telling me about stuff during her hours and hours of conversations, like, did you ever want to tell us, you know, me and my sister's, And she's like, I just figured when you were interested, you'd ask. (laughs) And um, there was one reporter in particular who really pushed back on like, why didn't you ever ask? How come you just lived your life and you, you know, that it took me into my thirties to ask the important questions. And I was like, I don't know. 
Yeah, you know, because we were dealing with our own things. <laughs> Uh, they probably seem insignificant <laughs> compared to your mom's experiences, but yeah. your mom had spent three weeks with you. I don't know how many hours of audio that you were able to capture with her, but the five part series that you had released with self-evident, I think is uh, roughly a little under three hours. So tell us a little bit about the process of listening to all of that. Um, trying to determine what parts you wanted to take from it to create a story. It happened immediately or was it something that you had to do in increments? Yeah. So like, so she came to visit that first time for three weeks and I don't remember how many conversations or how many hours we recorded. She came back that next summer. So I recorded some more. So it was over two visits and, you know, <laughs> over spans of months, you know, I transcribed all of that. And it, I don't know how many hours it was, but it was 67 pages of transcription. You know, as an, as an audio journalist, I let the tape lead how I do the story, you know? So as I was transcribing, just like making notes of like, this would go here, this would go there. And it's interesting because like, when you asked, did you have questions, like a list of questions to ask her? She really just talked. I let her guide a lot of what she told me. And she repeated a lot of stuff, which makes sense, you know, because I mean, if she was thinking back like 40 years, I mean, almost 40 years, she's yeah. thinking back. And I, it's astounding to me how much she could remember. The, the last night of that first visit, I remember it was the night before she was leaving. I wanted to still talk to her. I think I recorded about like two hours. But that was that night when she told me about her first crush when she was in middle school. Mm -hmm. She laughed in this way that I had never heard her laugh before. And like my mom never dated like while I was growing up. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think she didn't want to do that while we were kids. So I've her love life has always just it's not part of the picture or part of my story of her being middle school and having this giant crush and calling him her first love. Um, it, it did not end up being my dad, but like, just, she taught, it was just like, I never heard her just be so giddy and so happy. Yeah. There was a lot of like girlish giggles yeah. in that, <laughs> during that conversation. And I love that. And so like, I immediately made a note, like, I want to start the series this way. Cause for me, that was so captivating. I, you know, when I did over the span of many years, finally write all of it. Um, and then in more years, how many years I worked on it for a total of to get to a finished product that I could show people five years. And then it wow. took me a year to find the right home for it, which is, I ended up finding self-evident mm -hmm. since I had worked on it for over such a long span of time, you know, cause it was like a passion project, right? Yeah. Um, I had another kid working, um, having the self-evident team look at it with fresh eyes and like, you know, an outsider's perspective, it was, it was crucial. Wow. And I, I love that you, you took your time with it. Sometimes there's this sense of rush that you have to like, you know, put something together and put a finished product out. But I think the whole process of taking your time and reflecting on it, and I think you said it earlier, internalizing what you understood and what it meant and, you know, how do you connect those pieces together? Like that takes time. There are parts in the, the series that I love because your mom is like, she's very spunky and she reminds me a lot of my mom where like she'll correct me or like she's very opinionated. Um, and I love all those things. You know what, for them to survive what they had to, you have to be that. You have to have that grit. So I'm curious whether or not she inserted herself in any of your process of putting the story together or was she, um, did she have opinions on what she thought should be included or how she thought it should be told? Um, that's a funny question. No, she didn't. <laughs> um, you know, like <laughs> as I was writing it, um, you know, sometimes I would have a question, like a clarifying question each time I would, I would call her, you know, and she, she would, 
talk a lot longer, right? Because I was like, I just need this one thing. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> you're like, get to the point, mom. <laughs> but it was it was great. I mean, she needed to talk through it all, and so again, it was like through that process. It's like we got to hang on the phone longer because of that. But she she really didn't know what I was doing. Like this is the first podcast she's ever listened to. So I don't think she really understood what I was doing. You know, there was one time it was in 2018 where I had done a bunch of like rough mixes, you know, where I was just like voicing it on my voice memo, playing the clip, you know, and on one of her visits while she was cutting my hair, she, she always cut my hair. <laughs> she was cutting your hair. I love it. <laughs> she's the only one who cuts my hair. And she takes a long time to cut my hair, um, <laughs> which is great. She's like very precise, but it takes a long time. So during that, I played, I think, five episodes for her of these rough cuts because I wanted her to be like, oh, that's wrong or whatever. And at the end, she was like, yeah, that sounds good. And I was like, oh, okay. The part that we played that like as on the clip in the beginning of this interview I didn't play that episode for her. That was like the one part I didn't play for her. Um, you know, because- I was really- Did you feel bad that that's how you felt when she was visiting or why didn't you play Yeah, because I, it, it was an episode about our relationship and mm-hmm. that I was really nervous and hesitant to play that part for her. And so she didn't hear those parts until the podcast came out. And how did she react? Or did she react? I mean, you know, like it came out, I was trying to tell her how she could listen to it. And she texts me after she listened to the first episode. And I think it was just a very simple text, but it was like, great job or excellent or good work. You know, it was something Mm -hmm. pretty small, but it was like, that was all I needed. Like that was the validation I needed. So that makes me really happy because um, you know, the trust that they gave me, I was really nervous that I would get yeah. it wrong or that I would break that trust. But so far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's always nerve wracking. Like um, the first season of my, of the Vietnamese Boat People podcast was my family's interviews. And, you know, I, my siblings have listened to it, but I don't think my parents have. And I'm, I'm, I don't even want to share it with them because I feel like my dad is such a fact checker. Oh. He'll like, he only focuses on the facts. <laughs> so I can totally see him listening and just writing all bullet points of where I got it wrong. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about just your relationship with your dad. I, I know in a little bit of the show and I don't want to spoil it, but you know, your parents are no longer together and you didn't really grow up with him, which you had shared in the first episode. You didn't really grow up with him being in your life. And so tell me what your relationship with him is like. Okay. My family came to America, 1980. And at that point, um, my dad was in prison in, in Vietnam and he had organized, he had helped organize the boat that my family escaped from. And he got arrested when he was organizing another boat for people to escape. And so I grew up the first 10 years of my life, first nine years, he he wasn't in the picture, except as your father is still in Vietnam and one day will be with us, right? So that was always like one day he'll be with us. And I didn't know it at the time, but that there was like this, a, a, an effort to bring him here. Um, mm-hmm. We were sponsored by the Quaker Friends Meeting House in Chappaqua, and they did a lot of the paperwork and helped my mom with a lot of the paperwork. You know, it was communicating through embassies and state departments and all this stuff, and it was all paper trail, right? I mean, and there were lots of people trying to get people from Vietnam to the states during that time. Mm-hmm. So he was he in prison the whole time. I believe so, but I don't know the answer to that. Um, hundred percent. He was there for like a big chunk of it. Mm. He finally came over when I was around 10 in 1990. So excited, you know, but I, you know, I can't even imagine how hard it was for him to rejoin a family that had been assimilated to America for a decade. Um, Mm -hmm. He couldn't speak English, couldn't drive and and for us, I mean, like I was young, my, you know, it, it was hard for everyone 
when he when he moved in. And so he lived on and off with us for about a year and a half and eventually moved to San Francisco. Common occupation for Cambodians is opening donut shops, which I didn't learn until much later in my life. Like only a few years ago did I learn that. And so he he lived in in San Francisco. He ended up running two donut shops for many, many years, 20, 20 years, 25 years. Um, and as you know, I'm growing up, I maybe saw him like once or twice after he left our home. As an adult, what was it, 2012, I was going to return back to Southeast Asia. I'd ask my cousin, like, I'm going to go visit Cambodia. Are there any relatives I should try to see? And she's like, your dad is there. <laughs> and I had no idea. I had thought he was still in San Francisco. And I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it was, that's just how life is, right? Like, I just didn't know. Yeah. And and so, you know, through, she told him that I was going to come. She gave me a number to call for when I arrived. And I called that number. He came to pick us up. So I was traveling with my now husband. And I remember Scott asking, like, are we going to stay with him? Like, what's going on? I was like, I have no idea. Because <laughs> um, basically, like, we could never communicate. Like, I say that he learned donut shop English, you know, which is a lot. He learned to get by. Um, but me and him could never communicate because I never learned the language he spoke, any of the languages he spoke. So we went to visit him. I think we stayed like three nights and we did stay with him you know, he brought us to our, to his home and he's like, you stay here, you know? And it was like, okay. He, at that point was with another woman. Um, she was in her mid forties, early to mid forties. And they had a three and a half year old son. And so he had always wanted a son and he ended up having four daughters with my mom. He was not happy about. So like, when I saw him during that visit, he was happy. He was glowing like this three and a half year old went with us everywhere and my half brother and everyone thought that he was my son. And I was like, <laughs> no, no, he's, he's my dad's son. <laughs> um, and it was this really interesting trip. And it was on that visit. Um, he lives in Cambodia. He still lives um, in the town in, in Kampat where, where my mom grew up and he showed us spots were important to my mom. And um, it was really, it was, it, it was amazing. Um, and it was also where he introduced me to my cousin's sister. So my cousin came to America with my mom with two brothers and they had another mm -hmm. sibling who was still, who's still in Vietnam. And I never knew that. Or if I knew that I had forgotten that, which is like crazy how ignorant I was. And so I was meeting my cousin's sister. I grew up with my cousin and it was like, oh my God, there is so much I don't know. <laughs> and that was the moment when I knew I wanted, I needed to interview my cousin as well. Um, so it, it was an amazing, it was an amazing visit. Do you think at some point you might um, want to dig and learn about your dad's story? Yeah, I, I would love to. Before me was very intentionally about my mom. Um, a lot of my growing up, my childhood, you know, a lot of it was, I didn't have a dad, right? That was a big part of who I was. Um, my mom was a phenomenal single mother. And so this the, before me was just like my mom's story and, and to the detriment actually of the story. I remember letting some early, you know, a few friends listen to an er the early rough mixes. And one of them was like, you leave out so much about your dad, like what's going on with your dad. And then with the process was self-evident, they're like, we understand where you're coming from, but you need to give a little more. <laughs> um, and so I do, I did some new writing that involved mm -hmm. my dad and that visit. And it was actually when I was listening back, the process that I went through with self-evident was like a whirlwind. It was, it went by so quickly. But when I listened back, that was probably the only time when I cried was when I heard myself talking about my dad. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that still I still need to dig into to process. And I would love to hear not his side, but his story and what he went through and what he's still going through. Um, that was the part in the series that also touched me a lot because, yeah, so much of it, you don't hear about him. And then you kind of 
listened to that one episode and it just really connected. Um, and I think for people who may not be from our community or as familiar with the family separation that happened a lot, um, and you know, when they do get reunited, it's extremely difficult to reconnect. So much has happened, but what advice would you give to some of the people who are just starting out this journey similar to what you did? It's really hard. I mean, people have asked me this question. Um, first, I will start off just by saying that when people approach me or give me reaction to before me, a lot of it is, I want to do this. You know, they have a story they want to tell, they want to learn about, they have a family member they want to interview. Um, in some cases, that family member isn't around anymore. And so they want to interview the, like the surviving members. Um, and I actually have, I had one friend who, who after listening to Before Me, scheduled a Zoom interview with an uncle. So I thought that was like amazing. I, it's hard for me to have advice because it's really hard. Um, I guess the only thing I could tell people though, is that like the payoff is amazing, right? So like that space that you create by asking your loved one questions, you're showing them love that that person, like as awkward as it starts out to be, you know, that person feels that love and they're going to want to share with you if they're ready to share. It's one of those things that if you don't do it, I feel like there's more regret later on. Well, Lisa, I want to thank you so much for spending time sharing your story, your process, your experience for um, just being vulnerable with us. I know even though you, this project was five years in the making, like I'm sure it's always still so personal and emotional to you know talk about it again. Tracy, thank you so much for having me on your show. Um, thank you to everyone who's attended to listen. Um, your podcast and your organization is so special. So thank you for the work that you do. You can find the full five-part series of Before Me on Self-Evident Podcasts. And if you'd like to connect with Lisa directly, follow our Instagram and look for details on episode number 47. And thank you to Matt Young for joining me on editing this episode. If you would like to learn more about your family's diaspora story, check out our conversation kit at www.vietnameseboatpeople.org forward slash share. It's a deck of cards with questions in both English and Vietnamese to help you start the conversation. You can also check out our website for more stories and resources on how you can participate and share your story. I'm Tracy Nguyen Meng, and thank you for listening. If you enjoy the show and want to support our mission, please consider making a tax-deductible donation on our website. Your support helps independent shows like ours continue to amplify stories from our community. And please take a moment to rate us and provide us feedback wherever you listen to the podcast.